Are the attorneys ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. All right. In case, we're only having uh, hearing one case today, and that is State of Ohio versus Lynn Dow. And each side will have 15 minutes to present their arguments, and the appellant may reserve up to five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. If you're ready to proceed, uh, go ahead. Only okay. thing you need to do is let me know whether you'd like to reserve some time. I would ask to reserve three minutes, Your Honor. That would be fine. I'll keep the time for you then. Thank you very much. You may proceed. Thank you. Your Honors, my name is Jeremy Vled, representing the appellant in this matter, David Lindau. <clears throat> um, this is actually a textbook example of what happens when the police, in this case, consciously choose to not meet the constitutional expectations we have upon them, and then the trial courts don't hold the police accountable for their actions. In fact, as just before Your Honors came out not long before, I was asked the question, this is almost like a fact pattern for law school, and that's exactly what this case is. The officers in this case follow, consciously chose to not follow the law or their department's own policies regarding search and seizure. Counsel, you keep saying that they consciously did this. Does that matter? If you violate the Constitution, does it matter whether it's conscious or not consciously violating it? Maybe they made a mistake. Well, there was even a mistake made. In this case, one, whether it's conscious or not, does not necessarily matter. That the mistake was made, an error was made, is really the question. But when it comes to the obligations we put upon them, when it comes to when we, how we judge their conduct, not only in this case, but in a bigger sense, the fact that in this case, it's not where the officers made a mistake because they, there was some leeway given to them, and under the circumstances, they made a decision. And in hindsight, we're like, well, maybe you didn't do that right, but we understand why you did it. In this case, the officers, and the testimony was very clear, chose to not follow their own department's policies regarding tow inventories in this case. And, and from the Opperman case, from the cases in, in Ohio, where that department policy is in place, they have to follow that policy. Their policy was you have to get a search warrant. They chose, Officer Oldham even testified, he didn't follow the policy, he didn't do, a, it was clear he didn't do a correct inventory, even major tools were not listed. But when asked, do you actually have to follow this? He kept going back to, you know, it was that he didn't. He didn't have to follow it. The way he was trained, he didn't think he had to follow it. He was he not, aware of it? And he yeah. was, he was. That came out in cross-examination. Didn't and, he think that it was merely a guideline and not mandatory? He testified, it sounded as if he believed it was only a guideline, but it was very clear that this was in fact a mandatory pro process that they had to follow. And in that regard, I know the, the state in their brief commented that this was a cons essentially was consent, in that the defendant gave him his keys to, and therefore the officers could do the search. But the thing was is that the defendant was in locked in a police cruiser, having already been given a citation for an offense he could not be arrested for, because this was a FRA suspension. Statute is very clear, you can only receive a fine, you cannot get jail time. He, so he, his, he had been given a citation, he's sitting in the back of a cruiser, he had been removed from his vehicle, searched. His roommate, who could have provided him a ride home, had been sent away. So he's sitting there and the officers come up wanting his keys. So he gives them his keys. He doesn't actually have a choice. There's never any testimony. The officer's like, hey, can we go open these boxes with these separate keys? The officers are like, what are these keys for? They're for my boxes. And the officers go and do their thing. There's never a question of him, made of him, can we go do this? Can we go back to the issue of the non-arrestable offense for just a moment? Where are we going to find in the record that that issue was preserved for purposes of appeal? Well, that is where the ineffective assistance claim comes from, Your Honor, in part, because the initial, the Silver Lake Ordinance is the same as the revised code. The revised code specifically has for driving under suspension. FRA suspensions are their own subsection. He was indicted under the general provision, which specifically exempts FRA suspensions. The trial counsel never, in the suppression hearing or at trial, never argues this, never even shows an awareness of this. And it matters because even when you get to trial, he concedes the driving under suspension charge. Yet there's never any testimony 
that would actually be presented that would convict him of this general driving under suspension, because all the testimonies, he's got an FRA suspension that he's never indicted for. So that goes back to the, so in terms of it being preserved for the record, trial counsel didn't do his job. And that's part of the basis for the ineffective assistance claim. Um, now, in this case, this is also an unusual case. And, and this, this appellate district is different than a lot of uh, other courts of appeals. Um, a lot of courts of appeals won't really look into the facts underlying the case and whether or not the trial court really followed the evidence in making factual findings. This is one of the few appellate courts that will hold that trial court really to that standard. And it, it matters because the trial court in this case based its decision upon an incorrect factual finding. The trial court specifically stated that Officer Oldham smelled marijuana before opening up these toolboxes and therefore had an independent basis to search because he already had evidence of possible evidence of contraband. Officer Oldham on direct examination did not testify that way. Officer Oldham on cross-examination did not testify that way. He was very clear, and he even backed it up when he testified at trial, that he did not smell anything until the boxes were being opened. So he had this key that he was using against department policy to conduct the search of a locked toolbox in the bed of a truck, so it's not even in the passenger area. Their department policy says you have to get a search warrant. He doesn't have a search warrant, he doesn't have consent, but he's going to go do it. And he doesn't smell marijuana until he's opening up the box. Well, so, did he say that he was starting to open up the box, or that he actually opened the box? He said it was not until he was actually, until he was opening the box. At one point, the testimony was he smelled it after he opened, and another point it was as he was opening it. Either way, he didn't smell it before he conducted the act of opening the box. Either way. And he backed that his testimony at the trial was the same as at the suppression hearing, which is part of the ineffective assistance claim. Because trial counsel said, oh, he smelled it before he opened up the box. Trial counsel conceded that, even though the testimony was actually not that. The trial court's decision was based upon that factual finding. He smelled this before he opened the box. And as a result, the entire trial, the trial court's decision as a whole just falls apart. The trial court says, well, I don't have to look into this issue of did they follow their inventory procedures and comply with the Constitution because there's this independent basis. The problem was is there was never this independent basis. The, and, and well, what, it's, what would be the remedy then in that situation if the trial court is making it's like you said, we really hold the trial courts to their findings. So if the trial court makes a determination that's based on a uh, faulty uh, conclusion, I mean, uh, uh, misunderstanding of the facts, um, and then doesn't address the other issues, do we send it back and say, you got it wrong in your facts, or do, do we make our own conclusion? Under these circumstances, going with Hendricks, Liskow, etc., I mean, the trial court, the deference that they're given is only where there's credible evidence for that finding. In this case, there's not even credible evidence for that. The evidence contradicts it. And it's so clear this truth. My position, and going back even with the other cases, is this court could order that, no court, you got it wrong. This is the only evidence that's before you. We can make this finding. We're going to send it back to you. Even if that remand order is, you have to make it back to make this finding consistent with the evidence that was in fact presented. So send it back for the trial court to look at it again. Right. You could send it as back. As opposed to um, this court ruling that the, the evidence should be suppressed. My position, Your Honor, would be that your honors could or your honors could find, in fact, that the evidence was so clear that no rational trial court could find otherwise. So your honors could make that particular finding under these circumstances. Um, and then remand it because the, the act, you know, basically you would be remanding it for the trial court to just simply put it into effect at that level in terms of the suppression of the evidence so that the case could, the prosecutor's office could make their determination what to do with the case based upon the suppression of evidence. That would be my position. Um, and, in, and I know there was a question about um, one of the things, one of the questions your honor had about mis whether this was a mistake and I would point out that even following the Hine case from the Supreme Court which said that if an officer makes a reasonable mistake of law 
there's not a clear stat, you know, the statute's unclear or something like that. That doesn't even apply here, because the constitutional requirements, the tow policy, the statute underlying the driving under suspension, those are all very clear and direct. <clears throat> the one other point, and it eventually ties back to the ineffective assistance, but regarding the charges themselves at trial, and this is something that can't be emphasized enough, there was absolutely no credible evidence presented that this was actually marijuana in terms of the, case, the state's case in chief. So when you're looking at the criminal rule 29, only one officer testified that this was evidence. Detective Roach from the task, Summit County Task Force testified he, tell, he sampled a separate sample from a separate three gram bag. Because there were the containers of 28 grams, 14 grams, there was a separate nine gram container, a separate three gram container, which was in a separate place, which is in a different place than the others. He testified a sample from only that three grams, said it's marijuana according to my forensic testing. The problem is, is even though the prosecutor asked some questions of him regarding his experience, he was never qualified as an expert in forensic testing of marijuana. If I remember right, there's even discussion off the record in the transcript between the trial court and the parties regarding the fact that he had never actually been qualified in that regard. But, but the defendant himself, didn't he admit the same marijuana? He admitted it, right. But the problem is, is that the defendant should never have been in a position of being to testify. But if he's trying to assert a defense of his medical necessity of using marijuana from his uh, ability to get it legally in Michigan under a prescription, <clears throat> how would he not admit his marijuana? Well, that would go to the manifest way point. And Your Honor's right about that. The problem is, is there's still the sufficiency claim, the criminal rule 29 issue. And in the state's case in chief, the primary officers were never qualified, even on a common sense basis. Do you think this is weed? Why do you think this is marijuana, etc.? That was never established. They were never asked about it. And with Detective Roach, it was actually the same thing. Detective Roach testified that this three gram sample, this sample from three grams, is not actually preferred practice. It's not sufficient. There is never. You're, you're going to be entering your um, rebuttal time. So all I point out, Your Honor. Thank you. All I would point out is that the state's case in chief on that basic level of establishing this actually is marijuana, the state's case in chief was fundamentally deficient. And trial counsel just made it worse because he did not follow that line. He did not challenge appropriately in that regard. And that's something that any competent attorney should have been paying attention to. Based upon the officer's misconduct, the trial court not following its obligations regarding making the proper factual findings and therefore applying the law properly, Your Honor, and based upon the insufficiency of the evidence and deficiency of counsel. We would ask that Your Honors reverse these convictions, suppress the evidence, and remand this matter to the trial court to be followed through. Thank you. Thank you, May it please the court, Kevin DiMartino on behalf of the state of Ohio, the family, we are asking that this court affirm the decision of the trial court. With regard to the motion to suppress, um, when you look at the motion that was filed in the trial court, defendant appellate Lindau argued that the officers violated the Silver Lake inventory policy and that the search was pretextual, and then he also argued that it violated Miranda. So this issue with at what point in time did the officer smell the marijuana? Was it when he was standing by the driver's side door? Was it when he opened the box? Was it while he was opening the box? That issue was not before the trial court. The only reason why it's even in the journal entry is because the trial court found that it didn't have to get to the issue of the Silver Lake policy because the officers could look in the box based on an issue, a reasonable suspicion of contraband. So the reason why the suppression transcript is not very specific as to when the marijuana was first detected by the officer is because it was not an issue in the trial court. The testimony, and there is conflicting testimony, but that, that would be credible evidence upon which the trial court made its decision and its finding of fact, was first um, there was testimony that the officer smelled it while he was standing by the driver's side door. He also testified that he smelled it while he was opening the box. And the testimony, I think, that appellant cites to as uh, the most uh, in his favor is at one point the officer says, that was when I first smelled and saw the cigarette box. 
But that's when he's talking about two things. So he never says, I first and only smelled the, sick, the odor of marijuana when I opened the box. There's not clear testimony at this question hearing because that was not an issue before the court. Well, let's say then, like I asked your opposing counsel, let's say that we find that the trial court uh, incorrectly made that finding that it's not based on common credit um, What is the remedy then at this court? If, if the court finds that the trial court's findings of fact is not based on competent credible evidence, the court can still look at whether it was, that finding was even necessary and whether it affected the decision, which it would not have. There's, the the uh, appellant does not cite to any case or anything in support of whether the officer, based on a reasonable belief that he had a key and he was able to conduct a search even though the policy said get a warrant, that that would have no effect on that, that aspect of the argument. So it really isn't an issue based on what was brought before the trial court. And unfortunately, in this case, what is filed in the motion to suppress is the roadmap for what is going to be presented at the suppression hearing. Right, and the trial court didn't rule on that roadmap. So right. So if we find that the trial court erred in its finding in regard to when the officer had smelled the marijuana, then why wouldn't we send it back to the trial court to actually rule on the actual issues that were in front of it? Well, you, I guess you could send it back if you find that that was an issue that was before it, and because the court made this finding, it kind of brought into question what the sequence was, except that there is competent, credible evidence in the transcript that the court could have found that when the officer actually smelled the marijuana was when he was by the driver's side door, that he smelled it through the box. There is inconsistencies in that, that transcript because it wasn't presented in that fashion. The other question I have is, did the officer testify that he felt that he had probable cause to open up the uh, closed containers, the locked containers? The officer testified that he believed that it was his duty to check in all the boxes because it was an inventory search. Unlike the case that appellant cites to the Frazier case, the Frazier case, the uh, defendant was speeding, he was put in a cruiser, he didn't have his key. That's different than this case. The officer specifically testified that when you conduct an inventory search, for safety of the officer and for ease, you put the defendant outside of the vehicle. So that, that goes into the whole issue of custody for purposes of Miranda. But the officer testified that he believed that he needed to check into every area to conduct the inventory search and believed that because he had the key, that took him outside the <coughs> department policy of having to get a search warrant for locked boxes. Was this the same officer or a different officer who testified that the initial reason for the search was to find drugs. The office, it was the same officer, and the court found that he just had misspoke. How, how do you do that? I mean, if you're the trial judge and you have an officer who says, the reason why I searched this, uh, this vehicle was because I was looking for drugs, how do you as a trial court say that's not really what he meant? I think when you look at the entire transcript, there were three separate areas where marijuana was found. So the first area, the officer looked in, they talked about conducting the inventory search. When they looked into the suitcase after Mr. Lindau said I have drugs in there, and when they looked in the final box, he could have been referring to at that point he was looking for drugs. Certainly once they found the initial uh, marijuana with the cigarette box, and they brought it over to Mr. Lindau, and he said I have more marijuana in the suitcase, which was not locked, at that point they would have been looking for contraband. Well. And we have, have not yet uh, had the opportunity to review the transcript. Obviously, we will. But my understanding is that even at the trial level, the officer repeated what he said before, that yes, I was looking for drugs. That was the purpose. Uh, and, and I'm just not sure how the trial court can say, well, he was mistaken or he just misunderstood. What, what are we to do with that as a reviewing court? I believe that that only happened at the suppression hearing, and the court said that when you look at the evidence, it's clear that what they were doing was conducting an inventory search. So the officer misspoke based on the facts. When you look at everything, it's clear that's what he meant. I think he corrected himself later on in the testimony, and clearly it could have been, like I said, just a misspeaking because there were three separate areas that were searched. He could have been referring to any of the subsequent searches, and clearly at that point they would have been looking for contraband at, after Mr. Lindau indicated that it was there. 
Uh, with regard to the um, sufficiency, and the other thing I guess I would mention at this point too is comparing what the officer said at the suppression hearing versus what was said at trial court and then using that to somehow prove that what was said at the suppression hearing is therefore the fact is not proper. The trial court only had what was before it at the suppression hearing. So if things were presented in another way at trial or they were asked additional questions at trial, that cannot be brought in to determine how the court ruled out the motion to suppress. That's not the standard and it's not appropriate because that would not be what the trial court based its finding on. It would only have based its finding on what was presented at the motion to suppress. With regard to the amount of marijuana that was found, Detective Roach testified that it was a total of 166 grams, which is more than five ounces. He testified that personal use is about one ounce, and that in Michigan, if this was truly for medicinal purposes, that amount is 2.5 ounces. So clearly the amount of marijuana that Mr. Lindau had was excessive for personal use or medicinal use, and that was their trial strategy. That was the theory that began with the time of the stop when he said it was my marijuana. He said it was for medicinal purposes that I obtained it in Michigan. With regard to how much of the marijuana does an officer have to test to establish the amount, this court has held that there is no specific amount that you can do random sampling as long as the items are found in the same place, similarly packaged. And in this case, they were all found in the back of the same truck. Detective Roach testified that these, the marijuana was packaged in containers. One had 28 grams, three had 14 grams. Testified that that was the way a drug dealer would package marijuana or a trafficker, not somebody who would use it for personal use. So with, with all those, um, with that case law and evidence as to how it was packaged, the state would argue that this was an appropriate sample. The defense did not bring in an expert to testify that the sampling was somehow mathematically incorrect or anything like that. There was nothing there. Well, their point, as I understood it, was not anything that would have required expert testimony. It doesn't take an expert to testify that you have three different places where marijuana is found, right. uh, and only one of those is, uh, is uh, tested, wouldn't you think that uh, since they were in different uh, containers that it would have been appropriate to test each a sample from each container? This court has never held that way, and I don't believe there's any other court that has. The, the general rule is that if it's found together, packaged the same, then that's how you get the sample. Well, here, the case that you're relying on, though, uh, the primary case had to do with pills, and the pills were all stamped mm -hmm. identically. This is a little different. There's also a case with bricks of marijuana as well. So in that case, they said, the court said that the way they're packaged, they're in the bricks, that you don't have to test every brick, you can test one brick. And it wouldn't make sense for the court to hold that you can do a sampling if they meant you have to sample every single item. That wouldn't be sampling anymore. That would be testing each and every thing that was found, each pill, each baggie, each container. But the brick case, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was in one location. And like you said, they were all packaged identically the same amount and uniformly. That's a little bit different than just having baggies with different amounts in different containers. Right, these were containers. Three of the containers had the exact same amount. They were all within the same vehicle. And we would ask that this court find that, that this would be consistent with the other cases. There's no reason to differentiate. Um, this was not an issue that was raised at trial that they, you know, they wanted every container tested. We certainly could have, could have done that if that was going to be an issue. We relied on what the case law is in this district, and I, you know, we would ask this court to extend its holding to find that under these circumstances, with the testimony that this is packaging consistent with drug trafficking, they were all found in the same area, they were all marijuana packaged for um, for sale, even though. It, with no indication that hadn't sold at this point, that based on that, that that was sufficient. Was there any testimony that the appearance of the substance in these different packages was <coughs> The officers testified that it looked like marijuana, but as far as how did each baggie look in the container, I don't recall. Okay. Was there some, uh, I thought I read in one of the briefs, some reference to the fact that there were two different sources or that there were two different types of marijuana? I don't recall that. No. I don't recall which group it's in. If it's in there, okay. it's probably just me not recalling that. But 
and I don't recall. Um, the other issue that Mr. Lindau raised was that he testified that it was for personal use, so that should render the verdicts against the manifest weight. And clearly the jury's free to believe some, none, or all of what a witness testifies to. It's clear that the jury chose to believe that Mr. Lindau didn't have this five plus ounces of marijuana for personal use. Uh, with regard to uh, the sufficiency, that should be found in you know in the best light in favor of the the state. So the, the state would argue there was sufficient evidence presented prior to the state putting on its case, the defense putting on its case in chief. Certainly, once the defendant testified and admitted that the 166 grams were marijuana, that they were his, that they were there for personal use, then clearly the weight of the evidence also supported the, the convictions. And the state would argue that that was entirely the defendant's trial strategy. It was what he began with when the officers pulled him over. It's what he presented as a framework for his argument all the way throughout the, um, the trial was that it was personal use and that's why he had it and the jury just did not believe that. So the state would argue that that is not an effective assistance of counsel. It was merely trial strategy. And based on that, the state would ask that this court affirm the decision of the trial court. Counsel, um, you have not addressed the driving under suspension. The driving under suspension, the testimony regarding that was that the officer testified that he was driving under suspension and his driving record was introduced into evidence in the case in chief. Then he admitted it during um, his case in chief. So there was sufficient evidence and the weight of the evidence would show that he was driving under suspension. His driver's record is in the record. But there was the issue about whether it was the FRA suspension or the general statute. But that would have been an issue to have raised before trial, not an issue for to be presented at trial. Oh, it was raised uh, as a part of the ineffective assistance of counsel on appeal. Your brief did not address it. His, his argument on appeal, there's no... He hasn't shown anything that the trial outcome would have been different. He would have still been convicted of a driving under suspension. It could have been. The evidence was there. The, and just like when he talks about some of the uh, things that aren't in the record as far as the um, the testimony with when the officer smelled it, some of those things aren't in the record because there's nothing to talk about. If he truly had a suspended license, then why would they talk about it at trial? So it wouldn't be in that. It doesn't make counsel ineffective for not challenging it. He was driving under suspension. Well, uh, but the whole, the whole issue of whether or not it was an arrestable offense uh, undercuts uh, the uh, ability of the officers even to uh, inventory the, the uh, vehicle. Well, he wasn't under. At the point that they did the inventory, he was, he was told he couldn't drive the vehicle because he did not have a license and there was no one else there to drive it. So it doesn't really matter whether or not he was under arrest at that point. They had to do that, that, that inventory. They were going to do that inventory because there was nobody else to drive it. They, the testimony was they called for the tow before they had even done the search for the marijuana or anything else. So I don't know. And then the roommate, is, is this the situation where the roommate arrives? And I'm not clear on when the roommate arrived, but there isn't any testimony um, from the roommate or anything like that as to when he came or what the officers said. The officers were already conducting the search at that point, so they've already made the decision that the vehicle is going to be towed. They're not going to stop just because somebody comes up and says, I can drive the vehicle. It was, he wasn't in the car. Why not? The officers don't know who he is. They were already in the process of doing it. If at that point they stopped, I don't know what kind of liability that would put the officers at. They were already there. They were already following their department policy. And I don't think the record supports that this person who showed up, you know, asserted that to the officers or... No, the, you're, you're out of time. Oh, thank you. I was allowing you to answer that response to John's question. You have just a little over two minutes left. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm trying to condense this quickly. Um, to answer a couple of... to clarify a couple of issues that came up first, um, the testimony in this case was actually very clear when Your Honor was asked about the purpose of the inventory search. Officer Childers, <coughs> on direct examination, on cross-examination, and if I remember right, on redirect examination, testified that the purpose was first and foremost was to find contraband. Officer Oldham, I believe, was asked about four to five times regarding that tow inventory and whether they followed it and whether he was required to follow it. So the testimony is very clear about that. There's no question. Also, the state has argued about when the officers smelled it, because it was in our briefs and arguments. The 
thing was, is it was brought up at the hearing. It was point blank asked. So there's multiple occasions where Officer Oldham has asked about that marijuana. So it's, it's there. And the whole part of this was the pretext argument, which was made. If this is pretext, there's an issue of whether or not you've got an independent basis. If the officers are like, well, we're going to go look for marijuana, we want to look for marijuana, but they actually have probable cause, and they're just not realizing it. The thing is, is they still have a probable cause to search. So the issue of pretext was brought up. The issue of when Officer Oldham smelled something, it does matter. Um, and, and also to go back to what your, what your Honor asked, um, in this case, you've got the trial court regarding the, if, whether to remand. The trial court is minimizing the officer's misconduct. I mean, there's no way around that. So if your honors are to say, well, we're going to remand this for the trial court to make new factual findings, there's a first hurdle that we have to get over, which is the trial court's already tried to minimize what these officers are doing and to get around this issue and to say that even though this officer point blank on multiple occasions said that he showed that he had no understanding of our Constitution, we're going to leave it to the trial court to decide this issue. And that, I think, creates a problem. Also, regarding the random sampling that you're on and the sufficiency, you have to have it to get past the sufficiency argument, Your Honor, for the state to have its case proceed. They have to get the evidence out there to get to a prima facie case. And they never did. They never got it in a technical forensic sense. They never even got it in a common, in a common term sense. And to clarify what Your Honor asked and, what the, and the answer, these were in separate containers of separate amounts, some in separate locations. So you had containers with 28 grams, you had containers with 14 grams. They were not individual baggies within these. These were bulk containers, 28, 14, a separate of nine, a separate of three. The three was in a different place than the others. The nine was in a different place than the others. And all they did was test that first one of three, which is what Officer Oldham says he smelled when he opened up the box. Hey, counsel, you're out of time. Thank you. The court will take the matter under advisement. A written opinion will be um, prepared and sent to both sides. And you can also check for our release of our opinions on the Ohio Supreme Court website and the Ninth District Court of Appeals website. Thank you very much for your presentation to the court. Thank you. The court is adjourned.